He can take my place. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, convening this hearing and for co-sponsoring uh, the bill, the Stopping Medication Abuse and Protecting Seniors Act. I want to thank the witnesses as well. Um, we've, we've all heard uh, an enormous amount of testimony back in our states as well as here today about the magnitude of this enormous problem of opioid and particularly prescription and heroin abuse and the, uh, the, the tragic results. Last October, I did a field hearing with Senator Casey in southwestern Pennsylvania to bring local experts and victims to testify, and I was shocked when there was a standing room only crowd in a very large auditorium. That is just how widespread this problem is. Um, there's no doubt there are many things that we can and should do to try to address this. Senator Portman has outstanding legislation that's just been recently reported out of the Judiciary Committee, is my understanding, um, which will be very helpful. But there's two specific things that we can do that is the responsibility of this committee, and uh, our bill addresses these things. Uh, they, uh, those two specific things are, are efforts to reduce over-prescribing, and an effort to reduce the diversion of these powerful prescribed narcotics. The problem is a very real problem. The GAO has estimated that 170,000 Medicare enrollees have engaged in doctor shopping, where they go to multiple doctors who then typically unknowingly write duplicative prescriptions, which are then filled at multiple pharmacies for the very same painkillers. This is fraud. That's what's happening in most of these cases. It's an easy way for people to find commercial scale quantities of opioids which they can then sell on the black market. But there's also a subset of Medicare beneficiaries who are innocently getting duplicative opioid prescriptions from multiple doctors and pharmacies um, because there's insufficient coordination of their care. Uh, but that can lead to very, very bad health outcomes, including death for these innocent seniors. So the administration has been seeking the authority from Congress to allow Medicare to use the tool that Medicaid already uses, that private health insurers already use, to lock in beneficiaries who are abusing prescription opioids, either intentionally or unintentionally, to a single provider and a single pharmacy. And that, that's exactly what our bill does. It authorizes Medicare Advantage and Part D plans to assign one prescriber and one pharmacy to those beneficiaries with a pattern of opioid abuse. As I say, Medicaid and commercial insurers already do this. Uh, this concept, lock-in, as it's called for Medicare, was one of the recommendations made over the weekend by the National Governors Association. I want to thank Senators Portman, Brown, Casey, and Kane, whose offices and colleagues met and staff met many occasions with my staff and key stakeholders to get this bill drafted and get it right. And I think we have done that, Mr. Chairman. We've got a solid bill that will help opioid addicted seniors find treatment, will reduce the diversion of powerful narcotics to illegal black markets, will save taxpayer money, it will reduce overspending on opioids. It is uh, nearly identical to legislation that was already passed in the House in the 21st Century Cures Bill. And the bipartisan support that we have is very, very broad. It includes the president's budget. It includes the CMS acting administrator, the CDC director, the White House drug czar, the folks from Pew Trust, and I appreciate their testimony today, physicians for responsible opioid prescribing. Mr. Chairman, it's a very, very long list of important organizations that have weighed in in support of this legislation. I ask unanimous consent that letters of support from these organizations be included in the record. Without objection, we'll include them. And, and I would just say, uh, look, this is overdue, but this is a chance for us uh, to get this done now. There is more in this space that needs to be done. That's not a reason to do what we can do. So I'd like to just ask a couple of quick questions, um, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Cockle. Um, the data that I've seen suggests that between 1993 and 2012, the rate of hospitalizations for pain pill overdoses increased fivefold among people 45 to 85. Among people 55 to 64, the increase was sevenfold. Any idea of why this is happening? Thank you for that question, and thank you again for your leadership on this important issue. I think the increase in uh, hospitalizations and deaths that we see associated with uh, 
opioids uh, closely correlates with the increase in prescribing for the drugs. Uh, there's no doubt that there is an epidemic. CDC classifies it as an ep epidemic, and it, it peaks in, in late middle age, but affects all ages, uh, and as you say, has, has been increasing, and uh, latest data suggests that it continues to increase. And the uh, Government Accountability Office and the Office of Inspector General has discovered many, many cases of large-scale fraud. Now, you, my understanding is your background is as a pharmacist. Um, I want to read through a few of the, very briefly, some of the examples they discovered and, and um, one is a patient who obtained painkillers from 89 different providers in a single year. Another is a beneficiary who received in one year a 490-day supply of hydrocodone from 22 different prescribers. A Midwestern pharmacy billed Medicare for over 1,000 prescriptions each for two beneficiaries, and one doctor ordered almost all the prescriptions for each of these beneficiaries. Another beneficiary received prescriptions for a total of 3,655 oxycodone pills from 58 different prescribers. Is it, in your professional judgment, are these all cases of fraud? Well, I, I can't comment on specific cases, Senator, but if my math is right, 89 prescriptions a year would be a new one every four days, um, and, and, and that would be very, very unusual. And, and, and you know, if we look at the whole pattern here of people and, getting and multiple way, prescriptions. And these prescriptions are all for multiple pills, typically 30 days worth. Every four days, getting a supply like that strikes me as yep. very and, likely. And so you know, clearly there is some component here that's fraud. I think it's also important to recognize that some of these people are just falling through the cracks in the system and not getting good care. Some of them are trying to get adequate pain relief, and they're going from prescriber to prescriber. And whatever the cause, we owe it to them to get them into some kind of coordinated care so they're not at risk of, of dying or in the case of the elderly. I mean, this doesn't show up in the statistics, but use of opioids increases the chances of falling and breaking a hip very substantially. Right. So, so just on the fraud side for a moment, though, you would agree, I, I think, that the legislation that we're discussing today would dramatically reduce the chances that people could obtain multiple prescriptions from multiple providers and systematically uh, and fraudulently purchase huge quantities. Absolutely. And then last thing, um, you also, I know you looked at the specifics in this legislation because one of the things that we're certainly very concerned about is that people who have a legitimate need for these medicines uh, not be prevented from getting the legitimate need. Is it, are you confident that the, this legislation would not impinge upon a person's legitimate needs for prescription opioids? Yes, sir. Again, and, and the first thing to say is this is not a new idea. Programs like this are all already in widespread exactly. use in the commercial market and, and, and Medicaid. Uh, the, the patient uh, has a number of protections built into this legislation. They get a, uh, a strong voice in selecting the pharmacy or physician. Um, there are protections for, for people who have to travel, uh, for if there's uh, you know, not a supply available at their pharmacy, and, and so on. And we know from data that uh, People in these programs, for example, well, their use of prescription opioids goes down. For example, their use of other prescription drugs is not affected. So that's a sign that it's, it's targeting the problem that we're trying to target. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, uh